Right. We're going to talk about how to prescribe antibiotics. But before we do that, we are going to talk about the things that you have to have in mind before you even touch an antibiotic. Okay? So, we're going to start now. What's an antibiotic? What will you say? I will say that we will describe the describe an antibiotic because of their benefits and their risks, okay? What are the benefits? The benefits, of, they are weapons. Isn't that great? They're a weapon. We have a weapon here to kill some bugs that are killing the patient. That's perfect. It's exciting. They also help us to, to, to kill bacteria because they are less toxic to us than they are to bacteria, meaning that they are toxic. This is the message that I want to tell you here, right? The risks are that they are weapons. It's a risk to give somebody a weapon. It's a risk that we take a weapon and we don't know how is it going to kill and what is it going to kill, isn't it? You don't need to know this by heart, but you have to have a way in which you are, you are going to be sure that you're not giving the wrong antibiotic, okay? And allergies. Allergies are a problem if you give antibiotics and you don't ask. It happens, the most common example that I'm going to give you some common ones is penicillins. All the penicillins, including the cephalosporins, including astrionam, including meropenem, and the penicillins themselves. So the problem with penicillin allergy is that it has become like some kind of fashion. Everybody's penicillin allergic. And when you ask them what is the nature of the penicillin, the question is important. Because if it's just rash, you can give cephalosporins, you can give astrionam, and you can give meropenem. So that's safe because at least you can use something like the beta-lactams to kill a bacterium. But it has been my experience that even when you call a, a GP to ask what is the nature of the allergy of this patient of yours, they don't know. They just said it's an allergy and they don't remember their mom told them. I always think, well, if this person was going to die when he was a child and end up in, in ITU, they will remember. Because it's a big thing that you talk about in the family. But they don't know. So it would be nice if GPs, because I have tried to discuss it with them, uh, were to ask a question. Because the first time I came to this country, I had this piece of paper that I had to fill about my details. And they said, are you allergic to something? And no, I put no. But if I had put penicillin, it didn't say what happens to you when you have penicillin. And that is, that is the main question, because if somebody calls me and say, yes, but this patient is penicillin allergic, what is the point of knowing that? If we can't give anything anyway, because we don't know. Do you understand? Right. Now, antibiotics also have side effects, and they have interactions. The side effects, I'm going to give you again a common example. Thank God it's not that common, but it can happen. Coamoxiclav, the drug that we use the most with our eyes closed, it can be quite toxic to the liver. What about fluclox, fluclocacillin? It can be even more toxic. There have been some cases that have been identified in which people end up with having to have a liver transplant. When it goes bad, it goes bad, and it's not an allergy, okay? It's a, it's, it's, it's a side effect. Now, interactions. There are a lot of drugs that don't go together. Uh, one example that is, is, is quite impressive is linezolate, which is an antibiotic for gram-positive bacteria. Really good. And um, this antibiotic is like an antidepressant. It, in fact, the chemistry is that of an antidepressant. And if the patients are on antidepressants already and you give those two drugs together, you can cause this patient to suffer serotonin syndrome which is a syndrome that I want you to Google because they could die. So, you know, there are those, all these, the macrolides have a lot of interactions, but we're not going to talk about this. Now we're going to talk about these things in, in the other talk that I will give you. So, but one of the most important things here is the destruction of the normal flora. Why? Because if we give an antibiotic, all the bacteria... Some bacteria will die, some bacteria 
bacteria will survive. And it's the survivors that are interesting because those are the ones that are resistant to the drug you just gave. So we're gonna talk about this. The normal flora. We don't want to destroy it, but we do. We always do when we give an antibiotic. That's what we do. So, could you please tell me something about the normal flora? I want you to talk here. This is not me just giving you a, a, a talk. Tell me, what, what do you think, what is in your mind when I say normal flora? What, what is that? Say something. Whatever comes to your head, it doesn't matter. It's just me. Just say something. You have to have an idea in your head. Somebody say something, please. The body's immune system. Say that again? The body's immune system. Um, the, the, the normal flora that you acquire can teach the immune system how to behave. In fact, they teach the white cells how to behave. But, so it's, not, it's different things, okay? They, these are two different things. But yeah, you have an idea. Who else has an idea? There, like our gut, gut flora, it's what you would normally find in that area of the body. Yes. And uh, what else? Anybody? Thank you. Thrush. And, hmm? Thrush. Thrush. Candida. Women have candida in the vagina. There is a lot of candida in the, in the gut as well, but that's not just... This is just one example, isn't it? Okay. Anybody has any other idea? Because you need to know about the normal flora because you're going to kill it every time you give an antibiotic, and then you need to know what's, what is it what you are doing and how to prevent some things. Do you understand? Okay, so we'll talk about the, the, the flora. Okay, read that. It says that an average adult is going to have 100 trillion human cells, okay? But it ha they will have 1,500 trillion Bacteria. What is that? We're bacteria. We're just, we're just a human being full of bacteria. We are almost made of bacteria, aren't we? And how can that happen? Because in every cell, lots of bacteria can live. Because they are very little. They are only small, aren't they? So, did you ever thought about that before? In fact, you are just a lot of bacteria in a nice black dress. That's what you are. <laughs> so do you understand? So they must, if they are so important, because God gave us two eyes to be able to see. Just gave us one heart. Just gave us two kidneys. Why is it that we have millions, trillions of bacteria? They must do something. Do you understand? Have you ever thought about that? that they are there for a reason, okay? And I'm going to explain this reason to you using this, because I think it makes people understand. Now, this is Maracana. Do you like football? Who likes football here? <laughs> <laughs> this is the Maracana Stadium in Brazil. And this is like a cathedral for everybody that likes football. They feel they haven't lived if they don't go and see a match then during a match there to, have a, to, to, watch, to watch it. Every single person that is sitting in that stadium, first of all, I have to tell you, I, the gut is like this stadium in order to understand what's happening here. That's your gut, okay? That. Every single person that is sitting in one of those seats has bought that place and it belongs to them, right? So. I can buy my seat in that goat stadium and arrive late if I am not on time because something happens. And my seat should be waiting for me because it's my seat. I bought it. But if I find somebody else <clears throat> sitting in the seat, I can just say, excuse me, this seat is mine. And if it happens to a lot of people at the same time, maybe they will call the police. And who's the police? The lymphocytes, the white blood cells. And you call them, and they go there and say, you have to get out of there because this is not your seat. And if there is a lot of people enough there, then the white blood cells are going to fight it. And you will have inflammation. Because while they are trying to get those people there in the seat, 
because they don't belong there, they will inflame the seat too. And that is a problem for the gut. So you have to have the bacteria that you are supposed to have, all those, and more, as we know now, okay? So, do you have any questions about this? How do we get this flora? Do you have any idea how we get it? When a child, when a baby is not, not born yet, okay? It's, it's clean, it doesn't have any bacteria. I'm going to use normal words, okay? Just so that we can talk normally. The child is just clean doesn't have any bacteria, but as soon as it, it starts going through the birth canal, it stays in the birth canal quite some time, doesn't it? Why do you think that is? Because it's mother nature. When mother nature says to do something in some ways, that's precisely what we should do, because that is the natural thing to do. So the ladies that have a cesarean section, for some reasons that they really should have it, they, the babies don't go through the birth canal, don't they? But it's, it's normal that they should go because they start getting all the bacteria from mom, mixed with all the secretions in the vagina that mom has, mixed with all the poo, everything, the stools, everything. So when the child is born, gets colonized by all this, all right? And it... It's been said that it's genetical. If, if you, you get the seeds that you, with the bacteria that should sit in those seeds from genetics, half from your mom, half from your dad, this is a theory that I read some time ago, and you get them from mom, first of all, all the good bacteria that you're supposed to have, and uh, from that later, because you are going to live with him. This is, this is just uh, a theory. It's, I'm telling you in the easiest possible way. And think of a mom that has the cesarean section. Then she doesn't go through the birth canal. And in the United States, when they started investigating this, they thought, well, probably because the lady is born in the hospital, because it's a midwife that is used to being in the hospital, maybe they are, uh, not the midwife, in this case is the, is the doctor that does the cesarean section. Because they are in the hospital, they are colonized with bacteria that are alive. And here in the hospital, the bacteria that are alive are the resistant ones. The ones that are resistant to the antibiotics that we have, that, that we use here, isn't it? Because that's why they are alive, because they are resistant. The others that were sensitive are dead. So if you touch the baby, you can colonize the baby with your bacteria, which is not precisely the best. So you know what they do in the United States? Because of the, good, the, of the, good, um, of the benefits of having your normal flora untouched, we know now that the the little bugs are the ones that teach the lymphocytes how to behave. And the ones in the gut just go and sit in the gut, stand in the gut, like in small gangs. And it's the bacteria that starts introducing themselves. Look, I am E. coli. I am the bacteria that lives in the gut the most. When you see me, you don't need to attack me. And they go, okay. And then an E. coli 157 shows because that child is ill. And it will say, look, I am E. coli 0157. I'm not good. Like, like just, I can imagine all these bacteria introducing themselves. I am exaggerating for clarity, but I want you to understand it. So the, the little lymphocytes learn how to act. Other lymphocytes learn in the thymus and they learn with a teacher in a different way. I like to think that this is a nicer neighborhood next to the heart and the lungs. The gut is not such a nice neighborhood, so they learn in gangs standing there. But the little ones that go to the, the, the thymus just sit there and learn. Look, says the teacher, enemy. And they go, enemy. 
look, friend. And they learn, you understand? So that's the school closes at 12 years of age, the God continues for life because the, the thymus is not there anymore. So you see how bacteria can be of benefit. So if the baby is colonized by good bacteria, they will teach the little white blood cells not to exaggerate. And some people are saying that in some countries where there is not so much asepsia, and that everybody has to be clean. There are ads in the, in, the, in the TV that say, buy this because it kills 99% of bacteria in your clothes. No, thank you. This is crazy. And it doesn't happen anyway. Because I don't know. <laughs> I don't understand that. But in these places, we have children with a lot of allergies. Everybody's allergic because probably the immune system is overreacting because there are a lot of cesarean sections as well. So in the United States, every time a lady gets a cesarean section, you know what the ophthalmologist, the, ophthalmolo the, the, the obstetrician does? They will take some gauze and they will fill it with mother's secretions and then they put it in the baby to colonize them. And if you were to say this to a lady, she will go, oh my God, no. What do you mean? It's nature. That's precisely what the baby is doing in the birth canal. So you understand, genetically, we should have this. So what happens if I, if I, if I give an antibiotic and I just get some of that bacteria? Say, the ones that, this, this little bit here, and I kill them, what will happen? It's like what we have here just now, a lot of empty seats, and you're sitting there. If those seats get empty, do you know what bacteria do? They reproduce very quickly and they sit on the seats that are available. Why? Because they are, res they are resistant to, to the antibiotic you just gave. So if, if it's amoxicillin, and if you give amoxicillin, you will colonize your patient for a while with bacteria that are resistant to penicillin or amoxicillin. Amoxicillin. So say a lady that has multiple UTIs comes to the hospital and we take the sample, we send it, but we don't see the result. We can give an antibiotic wrong, a wrong antibiotic, nothing will happen, but you will kill some bacteria in some seeds that are not the ones that are causing the disease. And then the resistant ones are gonna sit on those. And the more antibiotics you keep giving, the, the worse it is. Do you understand this? Do you? So do you understand what I mean by selecting the resisting antibiotics in a mindless way? So there is a, this is called collateral damage of antibiotic treatment. And it causes resistance. Some bacteria will die during treatment. Pathogens are known pathogens. That bacteria do not die during treatment because they are the resistant ones. The spread of resistance, the resistant ones, might follow because we don't wash our hands. Now in times of COVID, we are all washing our hands. But we don't wash our hands as often now. So you can pass it on to somebody else. For instance, we're going to talk about the game changers, the bacteria that you always have to take into account before you even consider giving an antibiotic. But you, you can just, if, if this person is full of resistant bacteria, you can pass it on to somebody else if you're not washing your hands, especially if it's in surgery or places like that, okay? So we select for them and then we spread them. Nice. Now, the truth of it all is that selecting resistant bacteria with antibiotics during treatment is inevitable. You're always gonna do it. So if you're gonna do that, we need to use the right antibiotic to do it for something good, after all. Distributing them everywhere is crazy. One thing is ine inevitable, the other one is absolutely crazy. Now, do you know what happens to me? Sometimes the F1s ring me and they will say, Maria, you're not gonna like this. Because my boss says, that I need to ring you so that you can give us a stronger antibiotic because the one that we are giving the patient 
is not working. Excuse me? A stronger antibiotics, that doesn't exist. There isn't a single antibiotic that is stronger than the other. Because not all antibiotics are for the same bacteria. To say it in a different way, you can compare amoxicillin with meropenem. No, you can't. Because those bacteria that meropenem will kill are not the same as the ones that amoxicillin can kill. And for a simple thing, say amoxicillin or penicillin, those antibiotics, we tend to think of them as Meh, penicillin, amoxicillin. No, because if the patient has group A streptococcus and is going to die of necrotizing fasciitis, you need to give them penicillin. Because group A streptococcus that causes this disease is exquisitely sensitive to penicillin and as sensitive to amoxicillin. Every trust might have different things that they want to do, but they always include penicillin. Why? Because if you were a group of streptococcus and I go and I so much as shout, any ceiling, you will drop dead. You will. But I will have to go meropenem, meropenem. And why will you use meropenem? To kill a lot more bacteria in the gut? Just because you want to kill a group of streptococcus? Do you understand what I mean? It's not. If I have a very resistant bacteria, resistant to, mero, to, resistant to tasosin, I might use meropenem. But how am I going to know that if I don't send a culture and I don't look for the result? The thing is that nowadays, in our time, it's very easy to know because you just have to look back in the computer. If the patient is chronically unwell with an infection, is it very hard to look back and say that this COPD patient grows pseudomonas all the time and that he keeps having, having exacerbations because he's really unwell? And in the guidelines in the hospital, it says, here, and I, we wrote these guidelines, including me, and we will say to you, use amoxicillin and doxycycline. And I ask you, those two drugs, are they good for pseudomonas, which is the, the bacteria that they grow mostly? Of course not. So it's in us. It's in us looking back. And I know that when a person with COPD or bronchiectasis or, or respiratory, you know, um, um, cystic fibrosis or, or pulmonary, uh, uh, um, fibrosis, they will get a lot of infections. And, and when it's a long, long time, they will have pseudomonas. But if the patient is dead in A&E &E and is going like that and can breed, you can be a very good person and take the sputum sample that you should take. But it's not going to be ready until 48 hours later. So how is that helping you at the moment? It's not helping you. But the person who did that the last time the patient had a sputum sample, would have done you a massive favor because you look back and you see that this patient grows pseudomonas. So what is the point of giving amoxicillin or doxycycline like it says in the, guideline, the, in the guidelines? The guidelines are not wrong. You are interpreting. We are interpreting, interpreting them wrong. Wrongly. I can't speak. Okay? So my favorite antibiotic is probably gentamicin, clindamicin, but... It's not always the best. Like tasosin is the best antibiotic, of, the, the favorite antibiotic of everybody here. I always say, if tasosin was a woman, half of this hospital would have gotten married to it. It's ridiculous. Everybody uses tasosin. I think it's the only antibiotic they can write. Why? It's not always the best. And the guidelines can be wrong, can they? Or is it us that interpret them badly? And then, because we don't know what this patient grows. We don't know the history of this patient. We don't look at the disease and think, what is it possible? But if I don't know, I will ask somebody. Asking is really wise, because that's how you learn. And you don't even have to read it. Just ask. These are the resistant bacteria I want you to always think about, OK? MRSA, what does that mean? You don't say that uh, word, because you know. What does MRSA mean? Tell me. What, what, the, what does it mean? Very good. So, who can tell me what is methicillin and what was the last time you used it? Think. What's methicillin? What is methicillin? 
We are saying that this staph aureus is resistant to methicillin. Be careful with methicillin. Uh huh. So where is methicillin? Sorry? A what? It comes from penicillin. It's a penicillin. Yeah, it's a penicillin. Do we use it? No. Is it in the guidelines? No. Is it in the hospital at all? No. Methicillin, is there an antibiotic nowadays that is just like methicillin? Don't say it. <laughs> is there an antibiotic? Which antibiotic do you think kills gram positives and you know you can give it oral and you can give it IV, which is great? Is Who said that? Very good. Almost nobody can answer that question. So that's perfect. So don't you think this, anti this bug should be called FRSA? Fluclox resistant staph aureus. Shouldn't that be the name? Because then we will not use fluclox on a person who has MRSA. Because we will kill the patient. That's it. If nobody's watching. So fluclox resistant staph aureus, that's what it is. And in the United States, they don't use fluclox. This is a Europe where thing. In the United States, they use a different a different, they use oxacillin, decloxacillin, so they know what ORSA means. Why don't we know what MRSA means? Which is nothing, it doesn't mean anything nowadays. It's, methicillin is a dinosaur, okay? So what happens when somebody comes with an infection? Cellulitis somewhere. And we don't check whether this patient is MRSA or not. And because the guidelines say when somebody has a, a, an infection like that, cellulitis, and it's quite bad. That's why the patient cannot be treated in the community because the GP wants IV drugs here. So we will go for fluclox and then pen, don't we? Wow, the patient was MRSA. That's it. It's not gonna get better. It could, the, 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 the problem could get worse. Do you understand? How many times do we check that? And yet we give flu clocks with our eyes closed. And we are doing this without knowing that we are doing it. That's why, that's why it's not your fault. But once I talk to you, you will hate me because now you know. And then it will be your fault. Okay. So, oh, no, no, no. Then ESBLs and AMCs are, are, are bacteria that are resistant to almost all of the beta-lactam antibiotics, which we will have a list of them the next time. I'm just talking in general. And um, you can't give them because it will, they will not respond. Um, the, the last drug that they can respond to is tasosin, but some, the AMPCs don't respond to tasosin. ESBLs respond to tasosin, but AMPCs don't. So all the lovely beta-lactams, which are the antibiotics that we use the most, they are off here. You have to use meropenem when you find an AMC. And when you find an ESBL, you have to use tasosin. I will show you how to, be, to understand them. Because at the moment, when I, was, when I first heard those names, I didn't understand what they meant. I wouldn't be surprised, but you have to know that ESBLs and AMCs are very important, okay? CPE is the bacteria from the gut that is resistant to meropenem. So in two lines, including MRSA, we cannot use beta-lactams. How many patients do we ask, do we think, I'm gonna use a beta-lactam, I'm gonna use a cephalosporin, I'm gonna use a penicillin, fluclox, tasosin, amoxicillin, coamoxiclab, I'm gonna use those drugs, I'm gonna use astrionam, I'm gonna use uh, uh, kefuroxin, I'm gonna use kefotaxin, I'm gonna use keftriaxone. How many times before we write that down do we look whether the patient is MRSA in the past, ESBL, AMC, or CPE? If we don't do that, we're doing it wrong. And sometimes it's there, in a, you know, you can see it, it flashes in the computer, but sometimes it's your great work that will find it, because you have it here. And then GRE is glycopeptides, tycoplanin, and vancomycin resistance. These little bugs, enterococcus, they are not very virulent, but don't get endocarditis with one of them because it's gonna be very difficult to kill, right? And there are people who carry it in the gut. 
So, from the SBLs, AMCs, CPE, and GRE, they can be in the GOAT. So you see the GOAT, the poor GOAT, you know, <laughs> carrying all these things. And then pseudomonas. Now, pseudomonas is a gram-negative bacillus. We will talk about that. But it's, it's my favorite, I could say. Why? Because you can't kill that bug. I call it the SAS of the bacterial world. You can't kill it. Because if there is a mechanism that exists to be resistant, it will have it. Okay? So, but pseudomonas, because they are very busy being so resistant, they are not that virulent. They are in people who are immunocompromised. And we have a lot of people who are immunocompromised nowadays. Why? Because we, the, the, the treatments that we give them. And so a lot of people in these communities are, are also immunocompromised because of age. It's because they are old. So they are not going to, to really respond to infections as well as they used to be responding when they were 15 years old. So we have to be careful. You see how dangerous it is to use an antibiotic without knowing all this. Right. How do resistant bacteria spread? Because, because if somebody has MRSA and we give Fluclox, what are we going to do? Select for more MRSA. Because a person who has MRSA also has Staphorios in them. Say, this, say this is a person, this is a goat, and half of that, uh, half of the room is full of Staphorios, okay? But half of the room is full of MRSA. And I use Fluclox, I kill you guys. All your seats are empty. This comes and sits there. Now you fully colonize your patient with MRSA. And then you, you, you not only do that, you spread it to the next person. So if I say the word infection control, I used to have this, this response from an audience. The moment you say infection control, they fall asleep. Why? Because infection control and the proper use of antibiotics are at, at the base of good medicine. We couldn't do medicine if we don't get that right. Why, why, <clears throat> why does it happen? Because of lack of knowledge, lack of hygiene, lack of understanding of infection control procedures and guidance. You don't have to understand them all, just you can use your head. Um, some people have lack, lack of interest. Some people don't, are not feeling proud. They are just so tired that in the end they don't care. And we have all been there. I know, we have all been there. And we don't check patients' cultures. How sad is it when somebody gets given a Cipro because of a Ciprofloxacin because of a urinary tract infection, all right? Which has a lot of side effects. You give Cipro and then the result is been there for two days, three days, four days, and it says, resistant to Cipro, sensitive to meropenem only, because it's a, an AMC. No! You know, you know what it is, because the person that sends the, 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 the sample doesn't see the patient the next day. So who's covering this? And in the community, it happens too. I'm gonna tell you that once there was a gentleman that got given Nalidix, uh, um, got given the wrong drug for quite a long time, okay? For, a, and they said that this person was, a, was, was a, a man that had multiple UTIs and needed to have this prophylactic um, medicine in the community, okay? And he got it, he got it. He got given it for five years. And when we checked the results, he only had two samples of urine five years ago, and they were all taken in the same day. And it was resistant to the bacteria, nitrofurantoin, that he was given. And came back with pulmonary fibrosis. How can I explain that? It's just the lack of checking before you give a drug. I'm just telling you this, I'm not exaggerating, this really happened, but it's not because I want to blame anyone. But there you go. 
not checking patients' cultures, not looking back before you prescribe, and ignoring the game changers. MRSA, pseudomonas, what else did I say? ESBL, AMC, GRE, okay? And the complexity and sophistication of modern medicine leaves patients weak and immunocompromised. So they don't respond to antibiotics very quickly, so we have to give them the right one. And don't stop giving it, just give it, give it, give it. it when I say don't stop, it, I say that if it is three times a day, you have to give it three times a day. And if it's four times a day, it has to be given four times a day. If there is a drop in the level, that is dangerous. Antimicrobials are different to any other drug because when you are giving it to someone, it's not going to affect just that person. It's going to affect all the other person, people that are in that bay or in the, or in the ward. Because if a patient comes with a CPE, carbapenemase, meropenem resistant, gram negative, and you give them an antibiotic, you might treat it or you might not, depending on what you choose, because you don't know. But you are giving you, I give you this antibiotic. All of you are going to get affected by it because there is going to be a CPE in the world that is not being treated properly and it will go to everybody else. No other drug is like that. No other drug is like antibiotics that influences everybody else around you. It does. It really does. Okay? Do you understand that? So, antibiotic treatment requires the right antibiotic and you are going to be at the front of it. You are going to do it. You're going to have a great job doing that. You are going to be between the emergency room and the ward, and you are going to really look at this patient, see if all the samples have been sent, what has this patient grown before. What? If I was you, in your job, I'd be so proud. I walk, I will walk a bit with more pride because it's great, your job is amazing. You just have to learn it, that's all. You, have, you know a lot already, but if this has made you feel something, I think it's great, and I'm there, so you can come and ask me whatever you want. A floor, okay? So the right dose, because sometimes the, the, the dose is too small. In the community, sometimes they used to give flu clocks in doses to a grown-up man that are for children. Of course it's not gonna work. And the right levels, the levels, my God, the levels are a problem. We have a problem with gentamicin. I told you it's one of my favorite drugs. And it's the last thing we have when we have a CPE, right, gentamicin. The problem is that it is just good, mostly, for the blood and for urinary tract infection and the ear. But um, we need levels to give it. It's cheap, it's fabulous, it gets the fever if it's a gram negative, well, if, if, if it's in the blood, the bacteria, or in the urine, it will drop the, the, the fever. You know, now where it starts acting is fabulous. But we need the level. And the levels are a problem in this hospital. That's why we don't give it. And people say, eh, gentamicin is toxic. That's why we have to do levels. No, gentamicin is not toxic. We are. We are toxic. Because we give gentamicin and we don't even know anything about the levels. Who has given gentamicin and don't know, doesn't know anything about the levels? How dare we use gentamicin when we don't know how to maintain the levels in the blood properly? That is a massive responsibility. You wouldn't want anyone to give you gentamicin, believe me, if they don't know how to use the levels. Because you can go deaf. And your kidneys can resent that a lot. It's not fair, isn't it? When it's the best drug we can use for a lot of things. We can't use it here. It's dangerous. Right frequency, right duration for every patient that gets given an antibiotic. An easy method. It is. The gentamicin levels is not a, it's not a difficult thing. You just have to engage with it. I, I used, it used to happen to me. Somebody will explain to me how to prescribe gentamicin. <laughs> and I will forget. 15 minutes after I was told. So it's not easy to remember, but it's easy to understand. Um, 
I told you. Antibiotics are not toxic. We are, because we use them badly. Since the 1970s, we have this antibiotic stewardship. Why do we choose 1970s? Because in the 1970s, the general surgeon, I don't know if it's called the general surgeon in the United States, went to Congress to say, that's it. We're never going to have infections anymore in the rest of our lives, for the rest of our lives on this planet, because we have discovered antibiotics, we've been using them, there are some new ones now, he explained, and that's it. We have conquered infections. <laughs> Then he swallows, because we, he had to swallow his words, because we will never conquer little bugs. That's why I love you. I love them. I love you too. <laughs> but I love them, because they will, they will always find a way to be resistant to whatever it is we find to give them. It's unbelievable. I don't know. It's, it's incredible, and they're fast, very fast. So... Now we have this antibiotic stewardship because we now know that we are ending antibiotics that they don't really, it doesn't exist, an a new antibiotic now is too expensive to produce. They are trying. But remember, antibiotics are not something that people will use for a long, long time. The most, most of the time will be six weeks when the patient has endocarditis or osteomyelitis or chronic things like that. It's not like giving the medicines for HIV for life or other diseases. So the companies don't get much money when it comes to infections. And the thing is that most of the world do not have money to buy the antibiotics anyway. So they don't sell them as much as they would like to sell them. Sad, but it's not the only thing, but it has a lot to do with it. So, um, resistant selection is not in our, in, in our minds. That's why this is you know, some of the things that I want you to remember. People say cultures are too expensive and slow. That's what the government keeps telling the GPs. Don't culture sputums. Don't culture this. Don't culture that. Excuse me? You have to culture. You have to culture, but then you have to check the result. What is the point of doing that? And yes, some of them are too slow, but now we have a magnificent machine, machinery in the laboratory. I don't know how to say that. But it's, it's fabulous. It can give us the name of a bacterium in about four hours after we have grown in the special plate from blood cultures and other, and other, uh, and other cultures. So they are expensive, but it's more expensive to have a patient here in the hospital that doesn't get better and causes the infection to other people. Prescribing is easier than sending samples. So we go for tassosing. Sample results so, so should be checked and act upon. Healthcare professionals do not take samples, do not send them to the laboratory, and do not check the results. I can say that that is true. Not everyone, but a lot. Modern medicine is a balancing act. Modern medicine is that ballerina. And she stands in the shoulders of infection control and antibiotic use properly, antibiotics use properly, antibiotic stewardship. Because if we don't give the right antibiotic, the patient's not gonna get better. So, and if we know that a patient is gonna be infectious and we don't use our minds to think this patient might need to be isolated, the infection control team here is fabulous. You can just call them and ask. So what happens? The balancing act is gone. If the infection control is bad, in the, the way we give antibiotics is bad, forget it. This is not going to happen. And this is, this is modern medicine, the one that gives us a new heart, hips, knees, newborn marrow, treats leukemia, treats cancers. You know what, what else is going to be happening here? One day it will be hard to die. You know, but we're not taking care of it. We're not. We're destroying this balancing act every time we prescribe without taking into account these things that I just told you. And this, this modern medicine makes people very immunocompromised. If you are on treatment for leukemia, what are you immunocompromised? Rheumatoid arthritis, 
we don't see the deformities of rheumatoid arthritis that I used to see in Jurassic part time when I was your age. You know, we don't see that anymore because we have all the medicines that are necessary. But what happens when you give all this? Monoclonal antibodies. What happens? It happen what happens is that people become very immunocompromised. So they get infections. So there is a patient that could have been, as I know one, in, in A7 because they had leukemia. And at the end, when he was going to have his bone marrow, when he didn't have platelets, blood cells, nothing in the blood, red cells, nothing. He spikes a temperature and he gets a CPE, a carbapenemase resistant enterobacteria, bacteria from the gut. They, they couldn't do the, the transplant, the bone marrow transplant. So the time, the right time to do it went, went by and they, they just couldn't do it. They decided to start treating him again after one of the hematologists pleaded with NICE to be able to do it because it was too expensive. Finally, they did it. But what happened? He was only 30, uh, 40 years old with two children. And although everything had been perfect, he had the donors, he had everything, just a little bacteria, just a little one that he got from Greece, just that, cause he's dead. He died. And these are the things that get to you and you think, modern medicine, are you gonna be worth doing those procedures too? Do you know, we human beings, we don't learn from the past. In the times of tuberculosis, what used to happen when we didn't have any drugs for tuberculosis? If you had money, you would go to Switzerland, to, the, to, the, to the, the forests there, or the forests in the United States, and they will, you will live there. And it's really good, the oxygen that is produced there is amazing. It's the same one that allows us to kill bacteria, the white blood cells use that to kill bacteria. So of course, eh, they had a reason for doing that. Patients were feeling better. So if you had tuberculosis, you have to be to this, go to this asylum, asylum in the mountains or asylum in the middle of the city. But nobody cared about you. They were just hiding you. And there are a lot of people with mental health problems that people still ignore nowadays. Can you imagine in, during those days? So, so they used to live together until the People with mental health got tuberculosis. And the people with tuberculosis ha were having mental health problems because they were in this institution. And you would not be accepted in a hospital. Now, do we want to have cues? This is the queue of patients with CPE. This is the queue of patients that don't have CPE. Those that don't have CPE are the ones we're gonna treat. We're gonna give them a new heart. We're gonna give them whatever they need because the procedures are really expensive, the, the medicines are really expensive, and if this pe person is going to get a CPE or has a CPE that is brewing or whatever, it's not worth it. Not that the person is not worth it, but the money and the effort is not worth it. Um, don't you see? Don't you see what we are doing to this modern medicine of us? It's quite sad, really. Humans might never win but you have to keep trying, that's it. <laughs>